Good morning. As, as David told you, I'm the chair of the First Met Metropolitan Board, and more importantly, I'm the wife of our lector this morning, David Bray. In one of his readings this morning, he read from the book of Joshua. We don't often hear from Joshua. In fact, I didn't really know what he'd done other than fit the battle of Jericho when the walls came tumbling down. But in this morning's reading, he tells the Israelites to pick up stones and to carry them and to build a monument, to carry them out of the Jordan River and to, care, to make a monument to the memory of the miracle that happened when they were able to cross the Jordan River on dry land. But Joshua charged the people to be ready to answer their children's question, what do these stones mean to you? And they did tell the story to their children and their children's children because this story happened thousands of years ago. And that stone monument, even though Joshua said it would last forever, that stone monument is no longer exist and it's long forgotten. But the story remains. It was passed down until it was written down and we heard it today. So what is really important is not the stones, not the monument, it's what the stones mean and the story that those stones tell us. This scripture was chosen today because it's a lesson about knowing our own history and even more importantly, understanding what that history means to us today. What do these stones mean to you? As you know, we're going to have a series of discussions this week about our congregational legacy. The first one is on Tuesday at 1 p.m. in the social suite. The second one is by Zoom on Thursday evening, and you can get the link on the website. And the third is after the service next Sunday at noon. So I hope that you'll be able to make one of them, to attend them. Last week in Sheila's sermon, she put a very positive spin on the idea of legacy. She said, we are the middle, we are in the middle. We have received a legacy from the past and we will leave a legacy for the future. And our question is, what do we want that legacy to be? And during our planning for these discussions, I made the mistake of telling Sheila what little I knew about the history of our congregation, and she immediately asked me to do the sermon this Sunday while she is in Prince George at the conference. She was going to record a sermon, so how could I say no? It's not as if she's slacking off. I should warn you, though, that I'm not a preacher, I used to be a teacher, so be prepared for a history lesson. You may want to take notes. There will be a test afterwards. Um, yes, just kidding. But seriously, there will be homework. It is, to begin, it's often said that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. On the other hand, the German philosopher Hegel once said, the only lesson that history teaches us is that people learn nothing from history. And as I look around the world today, especially with the war in the Ukraine, I tend to agree. However, be that as it may, I am tasked with the job this morning of teaching you the history of this congregation in Victoria. What little I know of history of this congregation, I learned while I was doing research for my historical fiction novel, House of Crows. This is a little plug here. I don't know about you, but history as a series of dates and events is not too interesting for me. I'm, it's only interesting to me in relation to the people who lived those times and experienced those events. So, let me introduce you to 
Edie Innes, one of the characters in my book. At the age of 27, Edie, with her husband and three children, left her home in Scotland and traveled by sailing ship around Cape Horn and up the west coast of Canada to this place, to Victoria, when it was still only a fort. Her husband was part of a group of indentured servants who were hired by the Hudson's Bay Company to run farms to provide food for the traders at the fort and for the sailors at the Royal Navy base in Esquimalt. Once they arrived in Victoria, they journeyed by canoe up the Gorge Waterway to where the Craig Flower Bridge is today. And there, they attempted to create, to recreate the kind of farm and settlement that they had remembered from their past. They built a school, the Craig Flower School, and, and it's still there today. In fact, it is the oldest school still standing in Western Canada. And I was really pleased to learn that the building is still being used as a Japanese preschool. But in Edie's day, the school also served as a church. Services were held there once a month with Bishop Cridge from Fort Victoria, for whom the Cridge Center is named, presiding, or sometimes a chaplain from the Royal Navy. Now, Bishop Cridge and most of the chaplains were Church of England, or Anglican. And Edie was Scottish and Presbyterian. And so she longed for the kind of services she knew that she had grown up with in Scotland. So fast forward 10 years, when Edie and her family moved from the farm into the city of Victoria. And I do say city because in 1863, when she moved, that was the year Victoria was incorporated as a city. And in 1864, the fort was torn down. And Edie, oh, and I should say why it had grown so much in 10 years was because of the gold rush, first in the Fraser Canyon and then in the Caribou area. When Edie arrived in Victoria, she was overjoyed to find that the first Presbyterian church had been founded here the year before, 1862. And it was located at the corner of Pandora Avenue in Blanchard, just a few blocks from here. The first minister, John Hall, was sent as a missionary from the, first, from the Presbyterian church in Northern Ireland. So there was trouble right from the beginning because the Scots wanted their own minister and their own church. So in 1865, Hall resigned and moved to New Zealand. And a new minister was called from Scotland this time, the Reverend Thomas Somerville of Glasgow. But only one year later, after a dispute over financial matters, Somerville withdrew and formed St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. And he took all the Scottish settlers with him, including our friend Edie, so we have to say goodbye to her now, because we're going to continue with the history of First Presbyterian. It was gutted when all the Scots left, and it took 10 years before it recovered. Another minister was called in 1876, and the church thrived after that. In fact, when Edie died, her daughter Maggie, sorry, her daughter Lucy and her granddaughter Maggie came back to First Presbyterian. The church did so well that they outgrew their little building. And just before the First World War, there was a real estate boom. They sold the property and they bought this property here. The congregation marched from the Pandora site to this site on May 11, 1913. They held services in what is now the Doreen McLeod Room and the uh, chapel behind us. And two years later, this sanctuary building was completed and opened on May 2nd, 1915. But this is a history of the congregation and not the buildings. 
and this congregation is no longer First Presbyterian. The first name change happened in 1925 when the active union joined the Presbyterians, or at least some of them, the Methodists and the Congregationalists. And it became First Metropolitan United in 1997, only 25 years ago, with the amalgamation of First United and Metropolitan United. You recognize the building. Now, Metropolitan United has its own history, of course. Before Union in 1925, it was a Methodist church. It founded a few years before First Presbyterian, actually. And again, as a result of the gold rush population boom, settlers came, and instead of creating something new, they did as they always seemed to do, and tried to recreate what they knew in the old country, a, Presbyter or a Methodist church this time. In 1925, when the union occurred, Metropolitan merged with the Congregationalists who worshipped in the building across the street at 1600 Quadra. You'll recognize it with its ionic columns and classical revival style. It was occupied by First Baptist, as you see there, after 1925, and until uh, First Baptist moved to its present location, just a kitty corner from here. But this building is now condominiums. So what do we learn from this history of our congregation? I see a couple of different things that are really important. First of all, we learn that the one constant in history is change. Over the century and a half, the people of this congregation have moved from one building to another and have broken away from or merged with other congregations to form new congregations. And we've learned that buildings change as well. They grow bigger and smaller, and they can serve many purposes. Church buildings have been and are schools, daycares, theaters, conservatories, and even condominiums. And secondly, we learned that though the one constant is change, people are creatures of habit, and we hate change. So often when faced with a new situation and a new opportunity, we try to recreate the past and what we have known in the past. Is this what we want as a legacy? Do we want to do things as we've always done them, or do we want to go forward with creative new ideas that challenge the future? What do we want our legacy to be? We are at a pivotal moment in our history. We are in an unsustainable financial situation and change is being thrust upon us. Are we going to ignore the situation, continue as we've always done, and so blunder our way into oblivion? Or are we going to see this incredible challenge as an opportunity to define a legacy? Both are possibilities. And so I'm going to ask you, as Joshua asked the elders of the tribes of Israel, to carry these heavy boulders of our past with us into the future. And I want you to really think about the question that the children in Joshua's story asked their elders. What do these stones mean to you? And as you do so, remember that it is not the stones that are important. It's the story that the stones convey. I'd like you to take some time this week to be still, to pray, to ponder, and try to discern the will of the Holy Spirit for us going forward. Then please come to one of our discussion meetings this week and share with others your thoughts about what our legacy will be. That is your homework for this week. So, as we're talking about history this morning, I thought it would be appropriate to sing a heritage hymn from the great Methodist hymn writer, 
Charles Wesley, love divine, all loves excelling.